Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, my name is Beth, and I'm an alcoholic. And uh, thank you so much for asking me to come out and uh, share a piece of my story. Um, it's a really big deal for me. I, um, I'm an alcoholic, and uh, I started drinking at a very young age. Um, and I grew up in a home where there wasn't a whole lot of personal connection. Um, I wasn't close with either of my parents. I wasn't close, really, with either of my brothers. Uh, the only emotional connection I had when I was growing up was my grandfather, who I saw two weeks a year in the summer, and they would come up with from Florida. And I remember, um, I remember just being able to be with him, just being able to sit in his presence, just me and him. And uh, it was the only comfortable time I ever experienced um, as a small kid. I, uh, my story includes a lot of animals, and I bring them up today because uh, it's, again, taking um, a huge role in my life. I, um, my parents bred and showed dogs, and so um, as I started to get, you know, five, six years old, I started to show the puppies and train the puppies and work with the puppies. And, um, and so when the, the, I got a little bit older, I started showing them at dog shows, and um, we had, we had really good dogs, and we won a lot. So I assumed it was, you know, all about me. And um, I uh, would show would show dogs, and we would go to dinners and kennel club meetings, and they would have uh, gatherings and, and, you know, lots of uh, social affairs where there would be alcohol. And 90% of the time there would be open bar, so I would go up to the bar and I would order Roma Cokes for my dad and then suck them down. And I I don't remember, you know, being the life of the party. I don't remember. I just remember being a little more normal, a little more comfortable. Um, it was really the only time I ever looked forward to. School was not fun for me. I was didn't have any friends in school. I didn't know how to connect with other people. Um, I remember... In, it was either in kindergarten or first grade. I remember sitting at my desk, not being able to finish whatever I was supposed to finish, and everybody would finish their work and go and play with the toys in the back of the room. And I always felt like I was one step behind. I always felt like somebody had gotten some information or, or, or something that I hadn't gotten. And uh, I was always one step behind. So I remember this one particular time I just started writing whatever blah, 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 and then I, like, ran to the back of the room so that I could play, and then all of a sudden playtime was over, and everybody was going back to their desk, and I had missed it again. And um, we moved to New Jersey when I was, I think, six, and, um, you know, my luck followed me, and I came with me. And uh, that's when I started to help my brother empty my parents' liquor cabinet. Um, They had a bottle of wine in there, or champagne, I remember, I think it was wine, uh, from when they got married. That's how often they drank. And um, so my brother and I slowly started to empty out the liquor cabinet. I made a friend in, I think, fourth or fifth grade who, um, who funny enough, liked to drink. Um, and uh, we used to get together and drink Bacardi rum or cough medicine with codeine and um, make videotapes of ourselves. And, uh, yeah, we'd be singing all the George Michael tunes. Um, I've hidden those tapes now. They're not for our viewing pleasure. Um, but I, I never really felt, even though that I could connect with her, I just felt like, oh, my God, there was somebody else that I could drink with, and it, and it made the time go by a little bit faster. And, you know, I, um, I don't ever remember choosing to drink. I don't ever remember planning to drink. All I remember is... I remember one day coming home from school. I was in seventh or eighth grade, 
And, you know, it's like you watch a TV program and you see a kid, they come in the door, they throw their books down, they throw their, their coat down, and they go to the kitchen to get themselves a glass of milk and a cookie. And I remember one day very distinctly coming in the house and throwing my book bag down and throwing my coat down and going straight to the liquor cabinet. And I don't know why. I don't remember whether I had a good day or a bad day. I don't remember what happened. I don't remember how I was feeling because I probably wasn't. I just remember heading straight for the liquor cabinet and... um all through, all through my drinking, I was responsible for animals, um, animals in which I neglected, animals in which I abused, animals in which I took my frustrations out on, and um, it's been my biggest night <laughs> step amends. Um, my grandfather that I actually connected with passed when I was 13, uh, coming, came to find out a couple of years ago that he was an alcoholic and that he actually took his own life because he had injured himself and could no longer drink the way he wanted to. So he, he exited the game voluntarily. And um, so we went down to his funeral, and I got drunk the whole weekend. I was 13. And when I got back, I used it and manipulated my way. I remember when they pulled me out of class. My, my teacher pulled me out of class, and she sat me down, and she started to cry. And I was looking at her like, what, what are you doing? And she told me, your grandfather died. And I figured since she was crying, that must be the appropriate response. So I started crying. And, I, and I, unfortunately, I can't say that I was terribly upset. I didn't understand upset. I didn't understand hurt. I didn't, I didn't understand anything. Um, of an emotional nature, of a feelings nature. I knew rage, I knew anger, I knew self-pity, um, and I knew ego. And uh, I went down to the funeral, and I got drunk the whole time. And when I came back from the funeral, I was supposed to be graduating from eighth grade. Actually, I was supposed to be getting left back. And I used it, and I said, I can't, I can't take the stress, and I need to, you know, and I, they, they pushed me through. When I went to high school, I decided to change everything about myself. Um, I changed my name. I changed my look. I changed, you know, the kind of clothes that I wore. I went to a different school than everybody else, and I tried to recreate who I was, and I was pretty successful. Um, up until this time, I was the kid that everybody made fun of in school. Like, everybody. It was just there, you know, kids can, kids can be relentless, you know, and, and I used to feel really sorry for myself, even in sobriety, because, you know, you know, poor me, nobody likes me, uh, you know, oh, I, I have such a hard life, and, you know, the, the truth of the matter is, is, is that children are, are extremely keen and have very keen senses, and they sense anger, and they sense rage, and they stay as far away from it as they can, and I can honestly say that that's all I had to offer, that's all I had to offer. If I could bully you into doing what I wanted you to do, or if you had something I wanted, then I would be around you. Other than that, I just would rather just be by myself, and I think that kids pick up on that. Um, by the time I got to high school, I learned how to mask that with mascara and hairspray. And, um, and I discovered boys, and that with hairspray and mascara, they were much easier to get what you wanted. So I, um, unbeknownst to me, got a crush on the biggest drug dealer in the school. And uh, in my sophomore year, I started dating him. And I am an alcoholic. Um, Non-conference approved substances do play a pretty big part in my story and in my bottom. And I believe that they were fun to use. I got my hands on them at any possible moment I could. And what they did for me was brought me to Alcoholics Anonymous much sooner than I would have gotten here with just alcohol. I uh, I didn't care at that point. I was an empty shell of a person. I um, I didn't care what you did to me, or what you said to me, or what you did around me. As long as I got drugs and alcohol, that's all that mattered. That's all I wanted. Um, and so compromising positions really didn't matter to me because I would just blank out. As long as I could get drunk. And uh, bless you. And that's how I spent the rest of my sophomore and junior year in high school. Um, I went on the junior class trip, or so my parents thought I went on the junior class trip when I was a sophomore. But what I really did was spend two weeks in the woods, not sober, <laughs> not one bit all weekend, or all, all the, the whole time. Um, 
it just didn't, my life didn't matter. My relationship with my parents was non-existent. I didn't even realize that my brothers were really in my life at all. And um, there was nothing for me. There was absolutely nothing for me. I'd stopped showing dogs because, well, you know, you can't walk in the ring drunk. So I gave up on that and actually was so connected to my animals that I sent my um, my special my special dog. I sent him to Florida. I leased him out to Florida to a girl who wanted to show him in Florida, and I never saw him again. And um, it just was I was. There's nothing to me. You know, I really believe that if somebody had said, you know, do what I want you to do or I'll kill you, I don't think I would have cared. I would have just been, okay, just take me out. I didn't want to be here anymore. Um, I didn't have a faith. I didn't understand a concept of a God. I was never brought to church. And as far as my experience with human beings, well, my parents didn't really want me around, and my brothers didn't really want me around, and the kids in school didn't really want me around, so nobody here would miss me either, and I didn't exactly want to be around them, so I was ready to go. And uh, I got thrown in rehab when I was 16, and um, by the time I was 16, I was very good at... Uh, putting on the face that you wanted to see and to get what I wanted. And what I wanted was out. And what I wanted was people off my back. And um, my controlled drinking began right after I got out of rehab because now I was in aftercare or IOP or whatever it's called. And I'd been thrown out of one high school. I was about to be thrown out of another high school. And um, that summer came before my senior year, and I decided, oh, I know what I'll do. I'll go to New Mexico with my grandparents, and um, and everything will be fine down there because nobody will be watching me, and that's exactly what happened. I went down to New Mexico, and, um, and I did a whole bunch of things that I never thought I would do, and um, I hung out with a whole bunch of kind of people that I never thought I'd hang out with, and I you know, towards the middle of the summer, I really decided that I was going to stay down there and finish out my high school career and, and you know, and live my life out drinking and, and getting high. And no one would really notice because my grandparents are old and not really in touch with what was going on. And so I would walk in the house drunk and they wouldn't notice. And, you know, I would sneak out in the middle of the night and no one would hear. And, and I was basically on my own to do what I wanted. But I was there four days and, and I met a drug dealer. And um, so I was, you know, I had a supply of whatever I wanted. And um, I drank every day, and I did other things every day. And um, there was some pretty horrible things that happened. And then towards the end of the summer, we got um, trapped up on this mountain. And um, for absolutely no reason at all, I decided the next that, that the next day it was time for me to go home and get sober because this wasn't where I belonged. Now, I planned that night when I left the house was to stay here, finish out my senior year, and live with my grandparents. And for whatever reason, that night, in the middle of the night, we got trapped up there. The, the, the trolley car that goes up and down the mountain stops at midnight. And, you know, I wore a watch back then. So we got stuck up there. And for whatever reason, God said it was time to go home. And so the next day, I came down off the mountain and I went home. And I called my mom, and she bought me a plane ticket. And she picked me up at the airport with her boyfriend, who is now her husband, who had six months sober at the time. And, uh, you know, and he was like, you know, it's, it's really nice to see you. And he had met me, apparently, before I had left, which I didn't remember. And, um, you know, if you want to go to a meeting, I'll take you to a meeting. And, you know, he's, he's playing this song. This is my sobriety song. It's called Silent Lucidity. And she's making me listen to it in the car. And I'm like, listen, like, you are, like, way too old to be talking to me about anything. And um, that's all I remember. Um, I went back to, uh, to the meeting where I went, the very first meeting I went to, which was the Pyramid Club. And um, I walked up the stairs, and I saw this guy that I knew. And um, he was sitting with this woman who looked like she was 12. And I was 17 at the time, so um, I was better than her. And uh, I looked at him, and I'm like, who's the newcomer? And she's like, my name's Jeannie. And I'm like, hi, I'm Beth. And how much time do you have? And she, I think she said four years. How much time do you have? And I was like, three days. And um, 
a couple weeks later, a couple days later, who the hell knows, I, uh, I asked you to be my sponsor. And um, it was the first time I ever allowed myself to really connect to another human being, to ask another human being to do something for me to help me. And she said yes. And um, that was interesting. Uh, I, I really asked her because she looked like she was easy to manipulate. And um, I was wrong. She, uh, she uh, you know, my, I owe her a huge amends and um, a living amends <laughs> to, to, to be a good sponsor because she was the best sponsor that ever walk the face of the earth. I've never, I've yet to meet a woman with more patience and tolerance than this woman had for me in my first year sober because I couldn't go more than two words without the F word coming out of my mouth, which she told me numerous times offended her. I didn't understand what that meant. Um, you know, she, uh, she listened to all my stories. I told her things that had never come out of my mouth before. I told her who I wasn't. Um, and when she asked me who I was, I said, I don't know. Um, she brought me to my higher power, which I am so grateful for. She introduced me to my God. I didn't really have a conception. So I, um, so she said, you know, just get on your knees and just talk out loud. And I was like, okay. You know, and I was also under instruction that I was supposed to be reading the spiritual experience every night before I went to bed. And I was also to write in a journal every night before I went to bed and, you know, to this day, I still, uh, I still tell my, my new, my new sponsees to do that. So I, uh, I wrote in my journal every night before I went to bed and I tried to read spiritual experience, but could never comprehend the beginning of the sentence. By the time I got to the end of the sentence, I just couldn't do it. Um, I'm, I was so much cloudier than I, than I even think now. I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how I got it. But, um, so I would, you know, I would mumble through spiritual experience and then I would write like, you know, five pages in my journal of all the drama that was happening that day and, and how horrible it was. And, and I went to a meeting and, da -da -da, and then just every little detail. And then, um, and then one night I finally did it. I got on my knees and I remember it was a Saturday night and I hit my knees and I said, I don't really know if you're listening or if you're out there, but, um, yeah, I could use some help, and, you know, if you're not really there, then I guess no one's really listening, so that's it. And uh, I was uh, re-graced the next day. You know, you hear I hear t people talk about it all the time, and it's just a real wonderful thing. I had a pink cloud. I, um, I walked out the next day to go to my Sunday morning big book meeting, and... Um, and I, I think I saw a butterfly. I think that's really all it took because I was just elated. I was excited. I was um, no longer as, you know, I no longer had just the depth and weight of a blank piece of paper. It was as somebody had started to write something. And um, I just, I didn't know what it was and I, I, I couldn't explain it to anybody, but there was something inside of me where there had been nothing but a black hole. And so, of course, I went to, the, you know, I went to the club and I was bouncing around and people are like, whoa. And, um, you know, that, that grace lasted me a very, very long time before I was able to be in a place where I could do the work as I understand it to be done now. Um, I stayed sober for the first two years on don't, not drinking and going to meetings. Um, and it really, I wasn't able to really comprehend relationships. I, um, you know, my first, my first sponsor threatened me weekly to fire me. If, if I didn't stop using the F word, I got fired from a job at least once every three months. I moved every four months. I mean, to this day, I mean, my husband and I bought a house three years, three years ago yesterday. We moved into our home, and um, that's a record for me even to this day. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's to the point now where I went, I went to Sussex County, and I said, I'm moving back to Sussex County, and my husband and I are buying a house. Everybody in the room laughed because they'd been listening to me moving every four months for the first couple years I was sober, and then at least every year after that. Um, so when I said I was buying a house, they all laughed at me. They thought that was hilarious. And, um, so, uh, where was I? I lost my train of thought. But, um, so I moved around every three months and, um, I went to 14 meetings a week. I went to every single dance that was in the, you know, in the, in the tri-county area and, um, you know, went down to the shoreline club and, you know, never made it over the bridge to the city. Couldn't handle that. Um. 
But if there was a dance around, I was hopping in somebody's car because, you know, I didn't have my license yet. <laughs> and, um, you know, I was going to diners every single night, staying up till 2 o'clock in the morning, drinking coffee, wondering why I couldn't get up the next day for work. It didn't teach you that in AA. And um, <laughs> so here I am. I'm, you know, 17, 18, 19, almost 20. I have absolutely no life skills. I don't understand how people go to work every day. I don't understand how people pay their car insurance every quarter. I mean, dude, every quarter? When's the quarter? What is a quarter? Like, can, to this day, I still have a problem with the quarter thing. It's a fiscal quarter. It's an annual quarter. I don't really know. I have no life skills. I have no relationship skills. I have no work skills. I have no ethics. I have no morals. I have nothing. I'm two years sober, and all I know how to do is not drink, go to meetings, go to the diner, and go to dances. And um, it worked. You know, I was I was not happy. I was not joyous, and I was so far from free. I was I was less free in my first two years sober than I was when I was drinking, because not only was I not drinking and suffering from what comes with not drinking and not working a program, but I was also paranoid, like paranoid to the point where I couldn't go near a bar that I would be struck drunk. You know, I had been in AA, I had gone to other fellowships, I had had sober blackouts and woke up with a beer in my hand, like, that's not normal. So here I am suffering, and uh, I went up to celebrate my two years, and, um, you know, I, I just hit, you know, God graced me once again with more information, because I wasn't seeking it out for myself, and basically I got the great sense that if I didn't do something for my sobriety, within the next six months, I was going to drink. And, of course, that scared the living daylights out of me. And a week later or whatever, through circumstances, I wound up, you know, moving into this halfway house at two years sober. And um, when I moved in, you know, now moving into a halfway house in Bergen County, there's 32 women in this house, close quarters. I have an eight-by-eight eight room. I have to eat with people. I have to hang out with people. I have to go to meetings with people. I have to live with people. And um, they're all looking at me like, you have two years. What are you doing here? Like, they're all coming out of jail, rehab, off the street. They've lost custody of their children. Their marriages are over. Like, they're just getting in the game. And they're looking at me like, you've been in the game for two years, and you haven't left the starting line yet? And I'm like, yeah. So, um so I was full of myself, you know, I got what, what, what I like to call that sober ego, you know, cause I have two years and that means something. And, um, you know, a week or two into it, I started to hear the whisper around the house with, which was, you know, for somebody with two years, she really doesn't act like it. And I got scared and I got, <clears throat> I got willing. I had, a, I had a great counselor in my halfway house, a woman who actually works the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, she had me do my first fourth step, which is not the columns that I do now, but it got me to a place of, of some relief. I did my first fifth step. I learned things like how to make my bed every day, which I hear a lot of people say, that's not how you stay sober, but I still try to make my bed every single day because I'm irresponsible, I'm egotistical, and I think somebody should come in and make it for me. And it was the first real thing in structure that I was successful at. I actually felt successful because I made my bed every day. It needed to be that small, that simple for me to get it because I was that empty. And, um, you know, I learned things like it's really funny because, you know, you go on blackout for the first two weeks you're there and then, you know, you get three strikes and then you go, you know, you're not allowed to have any privileges. But if you don't, you just get the two weeks and then you can go out and get a job and you go out and get meetings and you can get, you know, a sponsor and you, and you do all that stuff. Well, I was on restriction for the first two months I was in the house because I couldn't figure out how to do all of my chores, which were three. It was like sweep the kitchen, vacuum the living room, and wipe down the mirror in the upstairs bathroom. I couldn't comprehend how to do that all in one week. And be in the house 24 hours a day, I couldn't do it. it. Took me two months to figure that out. That's that's where I was at. So I did this first fourth step, and I did this first fifth step, and I approached some of the issues that are outside the scope of Alcoholics Anonymous. And... Um, what I learned was that 
even though I have issues that are outside the scope of Alcoholics Anonymous, the tools that I have learned in Alcoholics Anonymous are what really saved me from them, are what really saved me from my hell. And uh, moved out of the halfway house without doing six and seven or eight and nine or 10, 11, and 12. And um, I felt better. I felt better for a year. I was flying high for a year again. And like anybody who knows me, like flying high for me is not necessarily a good thing. You know, I have a tremendous amount of energy. I'm very passionate about everything I do. Flying high is an extreme. That's not where I belong. But it felt good. And so I, you know, I went along this year and then I ran out of steam. And I was in a very, very sick relationship. Um, it, it was almost like, you know what, let's see how bad it can get before it gets better. He told me, I don't like your sponsor, so I fired her. And then he told me, I don't like you going to that Wednesday night sunrise house meeting, so I stopped. And he was, I don't really like the Sparta meeting, so I stopped. And then, you know, the control started, and I allowed it. And then the physical stuff started, and I continued to stay. And, you know, I come from a background where I'm comfortable with this kind of behavior. I understand this kind of behavior. I'm not working a program. I'm not st- I'm not changing. I'm not allowing God to get involved to the point where I can become that person I want to be. So I'm just allowing this stuff to go. I'm, not, I'm, I'm allowing myself to go back into a situation which is comfortable, which is harming me, which is bad for me. You know, and when I walked out, I tried to play the victim. And even I was like, yeah, I, yeah so I so chose to be there. I so chose to stay there. And I got to a point where God got me out, moved me to Morris County, I met this girl. She had 30 days sober. I had five years sober. She worked a better program than I did. She went to more meetings than I did. She knew more about the program than I did. She dragged me back to meetings. She dragged me back to another fellowship, and then I dragged her back to this one. And we started going to meetings, and we met a bunch of people, and we started doing all the same things that I started doing when I got sober, which was going to dances and going to meetings and going to diners. And um, then my stepbrother, who is also now sober, and my stepfather is sober, and my mother goes to Al-Anon, and we're one big happy family. Um, you know, um, he goes out west somewhere for a convention. You know, he liked, you know, they used to call him the coffee dude because, I mean, you think I drink a lot of coffee. He would just be hopped up on caffeine like, the whole weekend. He came back, like, on fire and wasn't drinking coffee, and he was still on fire. And he's like, dude, they're talking about this book, the big book. (laughs) You know, we all had one. You know, it's cool to have a big book. I got it in my car in case I get pulled over by a cop. I can prove I'm an Alcoholics Anonymous. And... um, and so, you know, he brought us, you know, we found, I don't, I don't even remember how we found Burnersville, but we all went down to Burnersville. We're all sitting there listening to Chris, and, and Chris is talking about stuff that I, I've never heard before. And then they're looking at me, and I'm looking at them going, I don't really know what's going on. And, you know, Chris came up to me one night after the meeting, and he goes, here's some tapes. And I'm like, oh, my God. I mean, what, I'm talking tapes, like, you know, like 150 tapes. He gives me all these tapes, and he's like, here's Joe and Charlie. Listen to these. So um, so I brought them home, and Jay and Dan listened to them. And, uh, you know, um, God, God was all over this time, like so all over this time, because this is not something that my ego was, allowed, was about to let happen. Um, I got this sponsor who is still my sponsor. Um, and... In my right mind, knowing who she is would never, if I was sick, never allow her to sponsor me. She, you know, she wants you to get well. She wants you to do the right thing, no matter what the cost. She wanted me to write an inventory and tell her things like, where was I frightened? You know, where was I to blame? How do I set these matters straight? I was like, oh, my God. So, um... So when I asked her to sponsor me, I said, you sponsor me? And, um, and she's like, yes. And I said, okay, but I need to let you know I, I don't sponsor people because they drink on me. <laughs> and um, she said, yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess she really wasn't listening to me. Um, and she agreed to take me through the work. And I uh, went to her house, and we sat on our couch. And there was a group of us. You know, We did a lot of the book stuff in, in a group, and we did a lot of the step stuff one-on-one. 
And I got on my knees with her, and I did the third step prayer, and then I sat down, and she says, okay, couple rules. And she said, no more lying, and your life is none of your business. And um, I wasn't real happy about that, um, but I'm very fortunate that my higher power put a whole lot of situations in my life within that, like, three, four-week span right after we did that third step where I had the opportunity to lie, and I didn't, and good things happened. And um, and I had the experience of, of starting to be who I was no matter what was going on around me. And what happened from there is I started to connect with other human beings. And I thought I had connected with other human beings before, but now I started to connect with human beings in a way that I was kind of leery of. I mean, it felt good, but it was kind of strange, and it was a new place for me. And, you know, I said, oh, okay, well, I'm just going to keep going and do what she tells me to do because this is not so bad. And um, I remember when I did my four step with her, I remember going to her house, like, freaking out. You know, I'm six, seven years sober, I'm seven years sober, and, um, you know, Cass, I just, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really not that bad of a person, and I've worked really, really hard in the time that I've been sober to become the person that I am, and I don't want to lose certain things about myself. And she said, well, what, what don't you want to lose? And, you know, because she kept telling me, you're going to change, it's going to be great, you're going to be called a totally different person, and I'm like, well, I really like my sense of humor, and, and, and I like this, and I like that, and... She told me, she says, well, you know, do you want to be free? And I said, yeah, I want to be free, but I really don't want to let go of this stuff. And she says, well, why don't you let your higher power take care of it? And maybe he'll just take the sick parts of your sense of humor out and leave the rest. And I'm like, what? But um, so I went through the work. I went through all the work. I went through all the chapters. I took all the notes. And then, um, and then I closed the book, and, you know, I started doing things like, calling my, my father and uh, asking if there was anything I could do for a friend instead of seeing what I could get from a friend. And um, I started to experience relationships on a new level. And, and then I got comfortable, and it was great. And it was like fall. It was, you know, it was wonderful. It was autumn. You know, it's my favorite time of year, and everything is wonderful. And then all of a sudden things started to get cold and things started to change. And I went to my sponsor, and I said, I'm not comfortable anymore, and I don't like what's I'm going on. And I'm seeing things about myself that I don't like, and I'm seeing things about others I don't like. And, of course, I saw that first. And then, you know, and, um, and then, you know, and I'm really uncomfortable, and I really don't like this. And I keep asking God to make it okay. And she said, well, you're just going to the next level. And I was like, what? There's another level? How many levels are there to this 12-step thing? And she said, as many as you want. She says, with every level of work that we go through, we get another level of freedom. And I didn't believe her because, you know, she had lied all to me <laughs> so many times. But um, I, uh, I was uncomfortable, and I was scared. And I, and I uh, you know, I picked up the book again, and... And I started taking situations in my life, and what she started to do to me is I would call her with a situation, and she would she would come right back at me with something we had done in the work. And she said, this is your opportunity to practice all the principles in your affairs. This is God's way of giving you the opportunity to become that woman you always wanted to be. And for us, when, when we did our fourth step, we did something called the ideal woman. And a lot of people know about the sex ideal. Sex ideal is something that I wrote so that I knew what to bring to a relationship. Well, I wrote, I wrote about the ideal woman so that I knew what I wanted to be when I grew up, that I had this ideal that I was growing towards, that I knew where I was headed, that I wanted to be this person. And, and every situation that would come up where I was to start to practice all of these things that I had written about and taken notes about and highlighted and underlined and talked about in meetings, you know, every time a situation would come up, I was, I was able to apply this where I used to just let chaos take over, and I started to become this person I always wanted to be. And, you know, that's when I started to look in the mirror and say, you're not such a bad person. And, um, and then I started sponsoring people. And I started taking them through the work. And, um, and I, th I think I'm, I'm a true believer and, and always have been that the relationship that I have with my sponsor is, is where I, I learn and I practice how I want to act in all of my relationships. And so what she taught me to do with her was to be honest. 
And what she taught me to do with her was to be, was to be um, present and available in this relationship with her. And I learned to have conflict with her. Um, and I learned how to argue with her. And boy, can we argue. And, um, and I learned to be vulnerable in front of her, which is very difficult for me. Um, letting my guard down to a point where, okay, you know, I'm in total faith in this situation and I am totally open to let and experience whatever God has us to experience is very difficult for me. And I don't do that in many relationships. I do that with my sponsor. I do that with my husband. I do that with three or four of my friends and I do it with my sponsees. And that's it. Because I'm still growing. I'm still learning, you know, and, and the amount of availability that I have to everybody else in the world grows very slowly, <laughs> but it's growing. And, you know, I've had experiences like, you know, now where that experience that I have with my sponsor is how I grow with others. You know, now it's what I have with my sponsees and my husband and my friends. Now I take that experience and that grows with others outside of the circle. And, um, and I'm starting to become more available to the people around me and, I'm starting to take risks. Um, and this, that to me is emotional sobriety. You know, going to the next level and having faith in my experience that God is in control and that um, my God doesn't care whether I'm married or not married, whether I work or don't work, whether I have children or I don't have children. God wants one thing for me, and that's to be happy. To be happy, joyous, and free. And if I want to align my will with God's will, then all I have to do is what makes me happy. And so I started to do that. My sponsor calls it Create the Reality You Crave. In the book, it's called Create the Fellowship You Crave. Well, I've decided to take what I've learned in Alcoholics Anonymous and bring it to the rest of my life. And, um, you know, this week was a new week for me. I, I, um, I actually, you know, I think about my dad a lot. I have, I have a long history with my dad. My dad, you know, cops at the house, arrested for child abuse, mental health, a whole bit. And now he's like, you know, really like my second favorite person in the world. He's an amazing human being, and he has limitations just like me. And this week, I, I think about him all the time, and this week I was thinking about him, and, 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 and I tend to be very emotional, but don't tell anybody. And, um, you know, sometimes my eyes, will well, my eyes will well up with tears with just, you know, thinking about him. And so what I decided to do is actually call him and tell him that. Huge risk. Huge risk for me. So I called him, and I got his machine. So I was very excited. And, um, and I left him a message. Hey, you know, it's Beth. I was just thinking about you. You know, give me a call. Let's chat. And, um, and he actually called me back. Like, well, wow. You know, my dad has... Uh, has changed so much through this process. <laughs> you don't know, really get it. And I'd love to say that it's my perception of him, but I'm not that big and I'm not that powerful. That man has changed. Why? Because I treat him differently. Like, I didn't realize it. I didn't realize that it's not just about me letting my guard down and allowing you in. It's about me letting my guard in and you allowing me in and you having the experience of me not hurting you. Because I tend to forget that I'm the drunk in the situation. I tend to forget that I'm the sick one. I'm the one that brought the damage. I'm the one that harmed people. You know, it talks about it in the book. And, you know, ooh, sometimes we got hurt. And, you know, when we really took a step back, we realized that I kind of placed myself there. And then I kind of did that myself. And, you know, um, the rest of the people in my, my world didn't do that. Um, so I just... Uh, I experience these things now, you know, I had a conversation with a sponsee this week where, you know, I called her up and I said, you know what, I really don't think that I'm an effective sponsor for you. I don't think that, um, that I have what you're looking for. And she said to me, she says, you know, I was going to call you this week and kind of let you know that I'm looking for a new sponsor. And I said, that's great. What can we do to help you find the right one for you? You know, it's like, I'm, I'm done with, with everything except the experience. I'm done with it all, 
You know, I'm I'm not good at at all the other stuff. I'm I'm getting much better at just having the experience. And you know, I said, well, you know, what do you think of this person? We see that person, and you know, we're going to meet up this week, and we're going to start to talk about different people that can help her to the place where she's at because I don't have what she's looking for. I'm, you know, I I after after his, you know, seven six years that I've been sponsored by the same human being, we've gone through hard times, we've gone through good times, but she still has what I want. I still seek and I still crave something that she has. It's an unnameable thing for me. It's not like I want her success or I want her profession or I want her marriage. It's something unspeakable. I think it's her faith. I think I'm seeking her faith. I think I'm seeking the experience that she has with her God. I think that's what I'm looking for. I think now that I say it out loud, I'm pretty sure that that's one of the huge things that I seek from her that she has that I want. And, um, and, and I don't, I don't have that with this woman. And I said to her, I said, you know, she said, you know, will we still be friends? I said, absolutely. I said, you're an awesome human being. I said, you know, when I'm in back in town, we'll get together on Thursday night at the meeting. She's like, that's great. That's wonderful. Cause you know, I'm, I'm also done with, um, you know, just cause I can't be of service to you. Or you can't be of service to me. Doesn't mean that I can't celebrate you and you can't celebrate me. And, um, that's new this year for me. And that's a big piece of emotional sobriety. And, you know, I'm, uh, I have a job right now I took for the summer where I'm away from home from Monday night through Thursday night. So, um, I don't get to see my husband. He comes out on Wednesday nights, but I don't get to see him. And, you know, I really thought that I'd be insecure and I really thought that I'd be scared and I definitely miss him, but I have a faith in him and I have a faith in my higher power that, no matter what happens, no matter where we go, no matter what we do, we're connected in a way that we choose to put, put energy into, and we choose to put something into, and so it's steady and it's there. And, um, and so I'm, I'm, I'm in, you know, I'm, a, I'm in New York for, for the week with a two-year-old and a newborn. And, um, I was sharing about this last night at my home group. Um, you know, for, for 31 years, I've been trying to get to this place where I don't feel angry, I don't get frustrated, I don't have jealousy, I don't feel these negative feelings, and, and what I'm watching is, is that this two-year-old has absolutely no corruption whatsoever. He's pure, he's wonderful, he's adorable, <laughs> he's great to hang out with, because I want to be like him. And he experiences frustration in his day. He experiences anger in his day. He experiences bargaining. He experiences jealousy. He has a newborn sister. He, he experiences these things. And what happens is he experiences them and he moves on. <laughs> I mean, dude, I've been working. I've been sober for 13 years. I'm not quite there yet. I don't really know how he does that. But it's like, you know, I sit there and I watch him and, you know, and he's, he's logical. He's a, he's a guy, he's two. And, um, you know, I said, Matt, you know, he says, I want to do this. And I said, well, we have to do this. And he says, no, I want to do this. And I'm like, well, how about we do this first and then we'll do this. He's like, okay. You know, the tears stop, the, the ranting stops, the throwing himself on the bed stops. And he goes, okay. And we move on with our day. Like, that's amazing. Like, that requires column work for me and a fifth step. And like, you know what I mean? He's like, all right, well, Matthew, let's sit down and talk about where you're afraid and, you know, what were your character defects. Like, no, he doesn't need that. He just does it. It's amazing. You know? And then I'm watching this newborn. And, you know, I'm experiencing so many things with these two little children. It's really, really cool. And I'm experiencing even more with their parents. And, you know, their parents, I live there during the week. And I'm, I'm lucky that, you know, it's part of my husband's family. So I kind of know them already. And, you know, I'm, I'm having discussions with, with their mom, you know, during the day. And, you know, we talk about relationships and we talk about her job and we talk about going to work and what is she going to do from here and where is she going to go from there? And, you know, I offer the things that are offered to me here in this program. And this woman is like so far from alcoholism. It's like, she's like in a different world. She's like so normal. And, um, and she looks at me and she's like, wow, that's a really good idea. You know, we talk about relationships, you know, and I talk about the part, you know, in, in, in the book where my sponsor made the rule that, you know, anything no longer than 90 days is no longer brought up in an argument. And she goes, wow, that's a great rule. She goes, you have rules in your relationship? And I'm like, yeah, without rules, people like me, bad, bad idea. And, um, 
you know, we're swapping ideas and I'm learning to communicate with the rest of the world. Like, what a gift, you know. For the first two years I was in this program, if you were in an AA, then you must be from, you know, Earth or something. And I didn't really understand that. You know, it's like I was speaking Chinese, we're all speaking Chinese, and the rest of the world is speaking English. And I just couldn't understand the language. So if you weren't one of us, then, you know, I couldn't get with you on any level. And that's not so anymore. You know, I'm learning how to survive out in the real world. And, you know, I take what I get in here and I bring it out there. And, um, you know, it's because of, you know, you know the, the Bernersville group um, has taught me so much about society and about being a part of things um, that I could be a part of, that I that I'm not in charge of and I'm not outside of, but I'm in the, I'm in the middle. I have balance. Um, and I learned that through the people there and, and becoming somewhat close with some of them and not as close with others. And, you know, I really know some of them and, but learning that balance, you know, learning that I don't have to run it and I don't have to run from it. I can just be in it. And that's an experience for me. And, you know, I have balance in, in my friendships. I have balance with my sponsees, you know, um, you know, sitting down with a sponsee and, and actually getting emotional and talking about something that it's difficult for both of us and I wind up growing with them and we're growing together and we're on this path together and and um and what an experience, you know, and I uh I look at my relationship with my brother. You know, my brother might be a candidate for this program, maybe he's not, it's not really in my business. I know he smokes pot every day. But, and when he doesn't smoke pot, he calls us in a blackout, you know, 11 o'clock at night, which is always funny. Um, he came to live with us when he got divorced. He lived with us for six months. And uh, I always wanted to have a relationship with him, but didn't know how. And so he came and lived with us for six months. And, you know, it's pretty neat when somebody lives with you for six months, and then after they move out, they still call you. Like, that's pretty cool. And, um, you know, it's really neat. I'm, like, growing in that relationship. You know, for the first seven years of my sobriety, I used to go to meetings every time I saw him, and I would cry, thinking, oh, my God, this disease is going to take him. This disease is going to take his life, and he's never going to experience the gift that I experience. And now I'm in a place where I get to experience him as he is, and it's still wonderful. And, I'm, and he wants to be a part of my life, and I want to be a part of his life. And we had this conversation where... You know, we wanted to uh, we wanted to put this family back together, or not even so much back together, but together for the first time. And um, you know, now we go out, we try to go out, or we get together once a month. You know, the whole family, and we do stuff like watch movies. You know, and they have you know these 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 corks about them. You know that I can't stand. But I love the whole package. I was talking to a sponsor the other day. There are certain things I don't like about everybody, but I love the whole package. I experienced the entire package. And um, I have less expectations today. I have more faith today. Um, I, tr I try to see what I can bring to a relationship instead of what I can get out of one. Um, and I think those... The two biggest lessons I took from my sponsor so far are is that the relationship I have with my higher power is truly unconditional. He loves me whether I drink or I don't drink. He loves me no matter what I do. Um, and the fact that to, to not have expectations on people and to just let them be who they are, where they're at, when they're at, and allow them to change, too. Um, I think... One of the few things that my husband and I argue about is when one of us has gone through, you know, a, a psychic change within our on, within our process, and the other one doesn't pick up on it because I'm self-centered, and um, <laughs> and I'm like, um, you're not acting like you, and uh, I don't like, I don't understand what you're doing because you're different. <laughs> so those are the arguments that we have now, and I'm like, you're healthier. How did you get that way? You know, and. Um, we have discussions, and I experience him as he is now. I don't expect him to be the way he's always been. And, you know, in our vows when we got married, they take on a new meaning every year for the whole three years we've been married. <laughs> but they take on new meaning all the time. And, and what we said to each other was that, I will help you become everything God intended you to be. 
I will help you be there. I will help you show up for life. And and I really feel like I know that he does that for me, and I try my best to do that for him. And I think that's emotional sobriety. I think I'm just here for the ride. I think I'm just here to experience and to play. You know, when I get in my car, well, I don't get in my car every morning now to go to work because I live there, but every morning when I wasn't working there, I get in my car and I'm like, okay, where are we going today? You know, when I let go of everything I want and, and let go of everything I think I need and just just go for the ride, then there's no reason to be disappointed because I wasn't expecting anything to begin with. I'm just here, you know. I'm hopefully, this is my last time around, and I'm just going to try to enjoy it. Do I get stuck? Do I get angry? Do I need to run another four-step? Absolutely, you know. But um, But with each level that I go through, I learn something new about myself and about the world, and I just try to keep adding it to instead of replacing it within my program. And um, I'm very excited about the relationships that I have today. I'm excited about the relationships that are growing in my life. And I understand from my sponsor that a person is in my life for the exact amount of time they're supposed to be, and that if I can just let go when they have to go, then there's nothing to be upset about. It's just time to move on. And um, and if I could just try to get like that a little bit more, maybe there would be less of a fourth step next time. Um, but I can only hope to grow from here. And thank you so much for uh, for asking me to come out and 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 um, and for letting me share a part of my story. And I'm very very grateful. Thanks. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.